Thank you very much. And uh, my colleagues have already laid the groundwork and uh, given you a taste of what we can do, and that we're truly the edge of a revolution in medicine. But they've approached it much more from a research uh, perspective, just about to go mainstream. And my task is to try and show you what we're doing to bring all these tests online to make them available for general medical use. Now, it's all about the science. And uh, a long time ago, like 500 years ago, doctors were also very caring and very studious and used the best and latest available technologies. In the 15th century, we knew that the cause of disease was caused by bad spirits and we would drill holes in people's heads and let the spirits out. Knowledge and science moves forward, and 400 years later, we'd moved on to leeches as a way of extracting. Again, this was cutting-edge research, cutting-edge science. But now we're in the 21st century, and 21st century, we've learned that there's an evidence base, a scientific base, and pathology is a branch of medicine that deals with the study of disease. And it's easy to tell a pathologist that all pathologists are doctors, and we've all been through a year or two of hospital and five years of medical training, and some of us done a PhD. And, uh, but what really teases it out is if you've got a large ego and you're extroverted, you become a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> and if you are dapper and suave and different, you become a physician. And then you go through all the other issues and the ologists and the issueners, and, and what's left is the pathologists. <laughs> and, <laughs> now... We, love, we tend to be introverted, we study, we're, in, we're backroom boffins. We, we are we're difficult people to live with. We're very particular, we like studying. And my wife has a fridge magnet at home. And when I met Mr. Wright, little did I know his first name was always. And <laughs> that's what makes me a pathologist. But what happened is, as science advanced and we realised that actually genomics underpins so much of disease, and genomics underpins cancer, and genomics is solved by applying these incredibly powerful machines and computers and techniques and maths. And suddenly there was a branch of medicine with people already trained in it. And that's what's happened, that as we're entering this brave new world, suddenly the discipline of pathology and within it the genetic pathologists well, there's not many of us, but we've got the right set of skills. And so that's how it is there's been this marriage between genetic pathology and the research community as we try and bring these techniques from the research laboratory into mainstream. So what genetic pathology is, we apply the search for these abnormalities in our DNA, as you've heard in the early speakers, and we try and bring them into mainstream medicine to make them available for the general medical community so that your doctor can help you make the diagnosis. Let me show you how it works. Patients don't actually turn up with a diagnosis. They turn up with aches and pains and complaints and symptoms and signs. And, and the doctor comes along and they're a bit puzzled and they think, well, what's going on? And they form a, a hypothesis, a so-called differential diagnosis. And eventually uh, they think, oh, that's what it is. Okay, It seems to fit what the patient's complaining of. And uh, we do a test, usually, in the laboratory. It's a pathology test. So patients present with symptoms and signs. Uh, uh, we perform tests, hit and miss. If the test seems to fit with what the patient's got, we say we've got the diagnosis, it's great. And if not, we say, well, okay, well, it wasn't that one. What was the next possibility? And we'll do another test and the next possibility. And well, then if you're lucky, you'll find the answer and be treated and get better. And if you're unlucky, well, either nature will play its course or you'll have lots more tests and you eventually get better. Well, oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. But the problem is that's one hypothesis at a time, one test at a time. But we've now got 6.4 billion possible results, 20,000 genes, and they all interact, as you've seen in some of the demonstrations. Sometimes it's one gene, two genes, six genes. We're all so different to each other. And the pathology tests, or the, the results tests, are interacting with each other. So we have a problem. Now, to tackle that, pathology has gone through an evolution. We started out with doing tests one at a time, then two at a time, then ten at a time, hundreds of times. And let me take you through and show you how it all works. First thing is single gene tests. These have been around probably for 15, 20, 25 years. 
They're very good tests, we still use them, and we test one gene. And examples of this in our community, it might be some people have cystic fibrosis, some have Tay-Sachs disease, these are both uh, genetic conditions that are common in our community. Uh, there may be sickle cell disease, which is a disorder of haemoglobin present in certain other communities, although it's now becoming increasingly uh, common here due to migration patterns. Um, it's cheapish, 50 to 200 $300 per test, and it takes a couple of days to do and it works. Great test, one at a time. But then there are certain conditions that don't lend themselves to one at a time. There may be hundreds of possible genes that could be causing. So the next step up was to do multiple genes at a time, a so-called gene panel. And the way this works is, we've set these up, you, you scour the literature, you read the best journals, the best textbooks, you go to the international meeting, you say, this is the set of the 200 genes that cause this disease. And you then spend the next six months to 12 months designing the laboratory test, and 12 months proving it works, and it always works in those with the disease, and there's always negative results in those. And just as you're about to use it, someone makes a great discovery, a great breakthrough, my heart sinks. On the one hand, I'm happy that we've learnt more. On the other hand, I've realised my test is instantly out of date and I've got to go back and revise it. It's been another year getting up. By the time I spend the next year, there'll be another discovery. So we've got a problem that the gene panels are great, but they really lock you into yesterday's technology and they're very hard to update. And they're more expensive, somewhere around the $500,000, $1,500. Okay. So the next step up is, let's not worry about it. panels, let's, let's do the exome. Let's do all the genes simultaneously, 20,000 genes, but we're only going to worry about the genes that do things, and we'll do them all at once. Uh, it's very complex, but it's doable in these days. Two, three thousand dollars will give you an exome, and it's very powerful technology. It'll diagnose about a quarter to a third of the genetic disorders you look for, provided you choose the, the right disorders. Very common these days in immunodeficiency. And the next step up is, okay, well, how about, why are you stopping at just the genes that do things? There could be errors in genes that don't do things, or genes that control other genes, or errors or mistakes between the genes. And that's where you go up to the whole genome, you do the works. And that's about 100 times bigger than the exome. Uh, there are certain technical reasons why a genome may be better than an exome, even than an exome, and it's very, 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 very complex. Uh, uh, you'll, you've heard it's 200 gigabytes of data, 6 billion... Uh, uh, analysis we do. Uh, David oversimplified slightly. You must be watching a little bit too much detective work when he said three days. Yeah, three days to do the testing. It takes between two and eight weeks to do the analysis afterwards to try and work out what it means. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's still. Um, but it's uh, from that we are having a hit rate of about half the patients that are referred to us, perhaps even two thirds, between half and two thirds, come up with a diagnosis. When we know it's a genetic cause, we don't construct the hypothesis, we just search the DNA and then we see what fits. And this is the way of the future. Well, there are pros and cons of whole genome sequencing. Firstly, it's, it's, a, it's a maximum diagnostic path, finds everything. It's the best value. If it costs you $2,000 for 20 tests and three, dollars $4,000 for 20,000 tests, clearly it's the cheapest per, per result. And everyone agreed it's the way of the future. But we're at the learning stage. There's only uh, two of these machines in the world, one here and one in the States, that are licensed to do uh, 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 clinical diagnostic testing. And it's got some drawbacks too. Uh, the drawbacks are, well, it's complex, it requires expertise. I'll show you later, we have a team of 50 people working on it at the moment to produce one result. It finds everything, and while you might think that's good, well, you went in for this condition, and we can tell you that, but you might accidentally find something you didn't want to know about. For example, you've got a stiff shoulder, and you go into your radiologist, they take an x-ray, and they find something that looks good. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. I'm alive, it's still okay. <laughs> I didn't realise I was right for sound. Uh, and they find something in your chest x-ray, or perhaps something growing in your lung you didn't know about. Well, on the one hand, it's good, you've found it early. On the other hand, you actually didn't, you might not have uh, uh, wanted to know that, or um, perhaps it may be news that will, will, will put you out of action for a little while while you go through the, the diagnosis and treatment. But so it is with whole genome sequencing. You go and looking for one thing, we will find everything. And so it's very important we know your views before we start. Some people want to know everything. Some people only want to know some things. And some people say, look, just tell me. I've gone in looking for this thing. I'm not really ready for the rest. And it's an expensive test at the moment. And it's a, a ration test. We only can do a certain number of people. And we're trying to focus on those who need it, uh, who need it most, where we can do the most good. So the so-called secondary incidental findings, um, 
uh, are what we use as the term to. When you look for something, you find something else. And a very important part of doing genomic testing is that uh, uh, doing genomic testing, we uh, uh, need to interview the patient and make sure that we know their wishes before we start. The cost of doing a genome has plummeted. So, David showed you it's, it's thousands of fold cheaper. It will become cheaper, but at the moment, somewhere around the three, four thousand dollar mark for a, a single test. And the way we uh, do the testing is we uh, have a consultation with the, the referring doctor who will fill in the standard pathology request form. These are available by paper or online. We then collect a specimen. At the moment, we're doing blood. We'll soon be doing saliva as well. Uh, we pass it through our sequencing laboratory, we pass it through the supercomputers, and then we painstakingly manually go through and review the final results to produce the final shortlist, and then we produce, still in this modern day of technology, we produce a piece of paper and give it back to the requesting doctor and say, that's what it is, but if you want to know more, we can provide any sort of uh, electronic analysis. And the beauty of it, you do it once, and if the patient's condition changes and you want to ask another question later on, you can go back and run the computers and do the review again. So it's, it's one test. That's why, like I'll talk about genome one, we only have to do it once and we do everything in one go. But as those of you who like doing jigsaws know, it's really, really hard to solve a jigsaw, particularly one with six billion pieces. And it's a lot easier if you know the picture on the jigsaw. So it's very much a conversation between the pathologist and the referring doctor. What are you looking for? Can you tell me what the patient uh, can, can you tell me what the patient uh, has got? Uh, uh, give me information about the patient because I've got to match the genes with what you're looking for. There's so many possible variations that are out there. So putting this uh, uh, in a diagram, we start with six billion genes and the typical person has got a, uh, we differ from the person next to you by roughly one of thousands, you've got three million differences. Perfectly healthy person has got three million variations from a reference, a normal, an average gene. And the computer quickly sorts it through, goes through the ones that we know are common, the ones that are not associated with the disease, sorts them all out. And finally, when it reaches somewhere around the one or 200 mark, the computer stop and they hand it over to us and say, I've done my bit, now you do it. And so we curate these all by hand. We go through them one by one and with the eye of experience and uh, knowing pattern recognition and then knowing that this goes with that or I recently read a scientific paper on that topic, we go through and filter out until we come up with the one, or in some cases two or three, most likely, which we then go and confirm in a standard laboratory doing a one gene at a time test, and that then forms the basis of our report. So we're extremely lucky here at the, uh, the King Corn Centre in the garden. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, one of the world's only two clinical diagnostic machines. Those that have been on the tour know it occupies a full room, a full floor of the uh, of the building, and the results are initially analysed in the supercomputers on the floor uh, in the basement, and have been sent off to even larger computer farms that are uh, too large to be occupied within that one building. And it takes uh, several days to just, just to transport the data around and do the analysis, and then it takes another week or two as we go through and uh, examine the, the samples one by one. Our staff have grown from an initial group of uh, half a dozen to now where we have uh, over 50 people uh, 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 working on, on the program, and uh, we, we imagine that we're probably about the size now that we need to be the minimum size in order to offer a clinical diagnostic service. So it's not just the machine, it's the, uh, the wide range of experts that you need to have accompanying to be able to put the different parts together. It's not something that will appear uh, in every, in every uh, medical practice or medical clinic. And finally, after all of that, uh, we submitted ourselves for accreditation through the NATA system and the Royal College of Pathologists. This is a very rigorous system that all pathology laboratories go through because we needed to go through that so the public and government would have confidence that the results we had were the same standard as any other pathology laboratory. And there's only two laboratories, and there were one in America and one here that have gone through this, this rigorous process. And that's the only one you'll ever see. It's the only Australian certificate of accreditation that exists uh, uh, in Australia. And we've chosen the name Genome One for the clinical laboratory because it's one genome and you do it once and you do it properly. And our vision, our mission for Genome One is to bring genomics to the community and make it available for clinical diagnosis. And it's uh, um, uh, the, the vision of the Garvin and the Kinghorn to, to be able to bring this uh, to the community. So let me move you forward now. That's how we got here. What's going to happen from now on? And you've got a glimpse from my colleagues earlier, but I'll try and simplify this in just a couple of pictures. 
You've still got the same patient. You're still going to get sick. You're still going to see a doctor. You're still going to be there. But instead of then constructing hypothesis, they'll do a bit of that. But increasingly, they'll go straight to your DNA. They'll say, OK, well, let's do a DNA test much, much earlier. In fact, let's do your whole genome. And then matching what your symptoms and signs are with your genome. I can straight away rule out a whole pile of things you are not predisposed to, and a whole pile of things you definitely haven't got, and a whole pile of things that you might have that I wouldn't have been clever enough to think of if it hadn't been for the uh, genomic test. And then from that, I'll come up with the answer, or a group of answers, and now that's going to whittle that down. But I've got to be very mindful of the fact that I've got to consult with you and make sure that you're comfortable with me doing that. So it'll be a much closer engagement between the patient and the doctor and the laboratory, part of this teamwork, as we try and work out exactly how best to help you, the patient. So we are truly the dawn of an exciting era. Uh, our initial focus so far, as we have uh, gone through the accreditation, is catching up on the backlog of the undiagnosed uh, conditions in those we know the genetic condition they're often children they're often uh, children of families that have been through the whole diagnostic process for years and have not come up with an answer uh, we've been able to give answers and in some cases these answers immediately point to direction for treatment uh, Dave is giving you a, a glimpse of what the future is uh, for, for routine cancer testing with genomics we're still only at the very beginning but this is going to grow enormously over the next year to next decade and potentially, we can help the government and society and the health system because instead of waiting for you to get sick, we may be able to offer testing and say, well, you haven't got sick yet, but you are at high risk of getting this condition in the not too distant future, so why don't you be treated before you get sick? And so we imagine there will be a very big move towards preventative medicine, preventative health care, and also matching the correct treatment to the correct patient the correct disease so you, don't have, you can avoid many of the problems of side effects and drug interactions and drug reactions in the future. Well, we've gone through history, all three, all, all the different speakers. We started a long time ago. Uh, we've gone through the discovery of DNA in the 1950s. I was a medical student here in the 1980s, 1970s, 1980s, when DNA sequencing was first developed. And I remember going to lectures and they said, you will never sequence the whole genome. It's too big, it's impossible. And I was given reasons to prove it was impossible. Because my teachers, bless them, they were unfortunately didn't have enough vision or imagination to predict what was going to happen, just as I'm sure I don't have enough vision or imagination to predict what it's going to be like in another 34 years. 34 years. And here we are today, we're capable of sequencing the entire genome and bringing it now to medical healthcare in Australia. I consider myself so fortunate and so privileged and so lucky to be still part of this journey. I, I was here when it was, I was a medical student when it was discovered. I was going through practice and thought it would be here. And it's taken 30, 40 years, a little longer than I thought, uh, but now it's reached mainstream. And it, it, I'm so privileged to be part of a group here. You see 30 of the 50 of us, that's all that fit on the Kinghorn stairs. There's a weight limit on the stairs. Uh, but really, uh, uh, it's part of a team that we're trying to develop the future. Uh, we are aware of our responsibility. We're putting the foundations for what tomorrow's healthcare system will look like. We'd like to do it well and we'd like to do it properly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.